be live streamed. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this I'm 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 very happy uh, to start with uh, the great lecture. Uh, the great lecture is part of the board of visitors meeting, and we have opened it up to the public because we realize how significant it is and how uh, how fun it is to showcase the the wonders that that uh, we have in the department in astronomy and and, and in the universe. Um, the, this, there's a big thanks to the College of Natural Science as the year of the AI, have you heard many times now. Uh, this is being live streamed on the McDonald uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and so that, that was uh, supported by CNS. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce a Dr. Uh, Stella Offner. Uh, Stella got her degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, she was on the faculty at the University of Massachusetts for some time, and then we were able to extract her. And we did this in uh, 2017. We have been saying for years since I've been here that yeah, we need a person who works in star formation, star formation, everything in the universe that we understand is affected by how a star forms. And we really don't understand star formation. Uh, and Stella is one of the world's experts in the theory of star formation. And now she's applying it, her, her knowledge, she's gonna use AI and ML to help us understand this. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Stella Offner as the great lecturer for uh, today. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Everyone can hear me? All right. So I don't need to tell all of you that we're in the midst of an AI revolution. You can see it on your phones. You can see it driving down the streets. You can see it on your computer. Um, and at the same time, we've had an increasing amount of AI coming into astronomy. AI has been able to power a broad range of science that was previously impossible, previously unimaginable. So today I'm gonna to focus on how AI intersects my specific area of research about how stars form. So let's make sure we're all on the same page about what is artificial intelligence. Now, I think some of you are still a little skeptical and have uh, maybe the Terminator in mind <laughs> when you think about AI. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that when we apply AI in science and astronomy, it's much less scary. So the term AI goes back to the 50s, um, and it was coined by John McCarthy. It's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. In addition to that, there's a subcategory of AI I'm going to touch on, which is machine learning, also coined in the 50s, which is the field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So under AI, this could be intelligent robots, but in science we normally mean intelligent algorithms. And for machine learning, when we mean a, uh, making a program intelligent without being explicitly told how to be intelligent, what we usually mean is the program is learning from the data. This is data-driven intelligence. And that is often what you'll see throughout astronomy and how we use data and how we combine that with AI to learn new things. So I'm going to talk to you about the potential for AI through the lens of my area of research. And I'll start off with open problems in star formation. Then I'm going to dive into three areas about why astronomy needs AI. The first is searching for features in data. Second, predicting hidden relationships, underlying physical relationships that we can't directly measure. And third, speeding up models. Then I'm gonna switch gears and talk about why does AI need astronomy? And I will tell you that it does. Astronomy has a lot to offer to AI and together we can really make transformative progress. Last but not least, I'm gonna talk about future directions for AI in astronomy. So, how do stars form? Well, uh, as Carl mentioned, star formation is extremely important within astronomy. This is not just my bias and that I work on it. But star formation influences a huge range of processes in astronomy. Uh, star formation powers galaxy evolution. It determines the distributions of heavy elements in the universe. 
it influences the formation of planetary systems and ultimately their likelihood to support life. Despite this importance, a broad range of questions are unanswered. Super basic questions like, what sets the mass of our sun and other stars? How long does it take to form stars? What starts the process off? What ends it? And why does our system have only one star, while more than half of stars are in systems of two or more stars? That includes our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, which is in a three-star triple system. So the answers to these questions lie in the birthplaces of, molecular, of uh, stars, which is molecular clouds. These are large, cold regions of dust and gas, which are in the process of forming usually thousands of stars altogether. So I want to give you some context for star formation. Um, the star formation process that produced our sun happened very, a long time ago. But we can look around us in the galaxy and other galaxies and, and see stars forming today. Now, star formation is a very interconnected process that spans a very large range of scales. So for this, I'm going to use the yardstick of the light year. So this is the distance that light travels in a year. But it also tells you how many years it would take a photon to travel in a straight path from one end to the other. So for example, this galaxy is about 150,000 light years across. Now we can zoom into these dark regions, these dust lanes within the galaxy, and see one of these giant molecular clouds. So one of these regions is maybe 50 light years across. As I mentioned, it's forming thousands of stars. So if we zoom in still further, we can zoom into a region of dense gas that's forming a single star system. We call those dense cores, uh, and there may be a light year across. Now we zoom in still further down to light hours, and we see an accretion disk. This accretion disk is a spinning a set of gas that is being funneled uh, onto the star. And it helps channel uh, mass from the larger reservoir of the core in the cloud onto that star. Now it turns out that there are a number of processes that start on the smallest scale and go to the largest scale. So star formation is a very energetic process. So as stars are forming, it turns out that not all of the material ends up on the star but some of it is flung out in very violent outflows. So we call these protostellar outflows. These might span um, ten, tens of light years. And uh, the gas moves with speeds or velocities of hundreds of kilometers per second. So as we go a little bit larger, uh, we see the impact of more massive stars. Massive stars have very intense uh, winds and radiation fields. You are familiar with the solar wind, which is uh, harmful for our satellites sometimes. But that is extremely weak compared to the winds of massive stars. These are incredibly strong winds that uh, push away the gas and dust around it and form these very giant bubbles uh, surrounding them. Last but not least, the most massive stars will end their life uh, in supernova explosion, dispersing the heavy elements that they've made in their centers out into the larger uh, region. So altogether, this circumscribes a cycle of life. Right? <laughs> so all of those beautiful images were actual observations. So I am a computational astrophysicist, which means that I don't actually use telescopes, though people keep trying to convert me. <laughs> I do not use telescopes, uh, but I do use uh, large supercomputers. So this is one of my instruments. This is the Frontier, a Frontier supercomputer at the Texas Advanced Computing Center right down the road. This is one of the largest and most powerful supercomputers in the world. It has more than 450,000 processors. So in my basic research, I take a classic approach uh, to studying how stars form. When I say classic, I mean that I use these computers to directly solve the equations that describe the physics of star formation. That is the motion of gas, gravity, radiation, magnetic fields, and stars. So the equations that I'm solving can be written down directly, like this one. So gravity is very important for star formation. So you need to uh, solve for the influence of gravity at every point in the domain. And as you know, all mass is attracted to every other mass. And so this is a very complex problem. So this is the Poisson equation. This g here is Newton's gravitational constant. And this rho is the gas density. Now, you can imagine it is much easier to write this down than it is to solve it, which is why we need supercomputers. So the way it works is we start with some initial conditions, a cloud of gas. We feed this into our computer. 
we have it solve all these equations. In the end, we get out a simulated star cluster. So the best way for me to uh, describe this process is to really show you uh, what this kind of calculation produces. So I'm going to show you a fly-through and time animation movie of a cluster of stars forming. In terms of the color scale here, low density is in purple, orange is kind of intermediate density, and high density is in white. Later on in the movie, you'll see yellow and green material. This is hotter or ionized gas. So this simulation was produced through the StarForge uh, project, the Star Formation and Gaseous Environments, which is an a, a interdisciplinary, a multi-institutional uh, project. You can see within this cloud, there's a huge amount of very complex structure. The gas that forms stars is actually supersonic. It's moving at very high velocities, kilometers per second. This creates a lot of complex structure in the cloud. As time proceeds, gravity will begin to make its influence felt. You'll see some beginnings of collapsing regions, which will be these sort of white dots here. Oops. Uh-oh, we have to start from the beginning. There we go. Sorry about that, you'll have to watch it again. Hopefully it's so spectacular that that, that was okay. I'll push, I'll push the right a laser button this time. Ah, okay. So. Uh, there are dense cores uh, forming this very complex flow. You can see that they're very small relative to the, the entire cloud here. As they collapse, uh, they will begin to form these protostellar outflows and disks. The disks are too small on the scale, we can't see them, but we can see these very energetic bipolar outflows. And so you'll begin to see these uh, being launched, uh, particularly associated with some yellow gas. There's one right down there. You can see it's sort of variable as it goes along. As time goes forward, you'll see more and more stars forming. Um, and they're very clustered. They can form these small clusters along these filaments in the gas. As accretion continues, you get more and more massive stars. You'll begin to see the impact of the first stellar winds and radiation from massive stars blowing bubbles. There's one here. Here's another one going. So altogether, there's something like uh, 20,000 solar masses of gas in the calculation. 20 million uh, cells or particles we're following. And this includes magnetic fields, radiation, stars, outflows, winds, and supernova. So this continues a little bit further. You'll see some dark areas. Um, that is actually seeing through the cloud, um, these dark regions here. Um, so what you're getting to here is what we would say is an optically revealed uh, star cluster where it's no longer embedded in the dust and gas. Now a lot of the gas is being expelled and pushed away by these massive stars, the radiation, ionization, winds. Uh, but the at the very last, uh, the most massive star uh, goes supernova, and you'll see a flash. All right, so where does AI fit into all of this? As I said, these simulations and models are classic where we directly solve the equations. For me, AI is the glue that allows us to compare and uh, 
get information out of the observational data. So if we can use our simulations together with AI, we can really learn a lot more from the observational data. So let's move on to what we can actually do with the AI, searching with features. Now, a fundamental problem and a perk of astronomy is that there is an awful lot of data. So right now, we are panning along our galactic plane. This is a Spitzer Galactic Plane Survey. We're only looking at one-eighth of the galactic plane. You can see all this beautiful and rich structure. This over here is a star-forming cloud, this dark region. Uh, but in addition to all these dark patches, you can also see a variety of yellow and red and green regions. These are shells made by young massive stars and star clusters, so a bubbling galaxy. And so one thing we might want to do is get a census of all of these bubbles and study the impact that they have on their surroundings. So one way of doing that is citizen science, and you heard about this this morning. Citizen science is extremely powerful uh, and was used to process a lot of this data. So in this citizen science project, you could log on, and then you would be confronted with an image like this one, and it would ask you, is this uh, a bubble or does it contain a stellar bubble? And you would say yes, and then you would draw a little circle to indicate the size of that bubble. Now, in addition to that one, that's pretty clear, but what about something like this? Is this a bubble, or is it a shock, or is it a yellow ball? Um, those are options here. It's really not totally clear. So although citizen science is powerful, um, it has pluses and minuses, right? So on the plus side, uh, we can engage the public in science, that's all of you, and all of you are funding us, so we really want to get you involved as much as possible. Second, members of the public are way more numerous than professional astronomers, and this is amazing, unlike graduate students, they work for free. <laughs> um, and last but not least, uh, people are pretty smart, right? They can identify atypical cases. And many of these citizen science projects have message boards where people can log on and say, hey, I saw this weird thing in that image, what is it? And then that can spawn new discoveries. Now on the negative side, um, different people have different opinions. Second, uh, in order to get people to have the same opinion, give the same response, these problems need to be formulated with very simple instructions. And, of course, people can be hangry. <laughs> Depending upon whether they had lunch or not or breakfast, they might decide there is a bubble or is not a bubble in a given image. And even if you go to professional astronomers, um, even the experts don't know the right answer. <laughs> Good thing I have tenure already, so it's fine. <laughs> so this brings us to AI in the form of deep learning. So what if we could develop an approach that was as smart as people, but was more reliable, didn't need to eat, we didn't need to pay it, and was never irritable? That would be amazing. So the type of analysis we want to do in this problem is image processing, and it turns out we have a great model already that's an expert image processor, which is the human brain, right? So your brain is filled with billions, maybe some 80 or 90 billion neurons with 100 trillion connections. So this is a neural network. So what happens with a neuron is there's some input chemical signal. Depending upon the significance of that signal, the neuron will decide what to do with it. Maybe it will boost it. Maybe it will uh, not do anything, but maybe it'll pass it along to the next one. And the next neuron, in turn, will uh, receive the signal, and the process continues. So within the brain, um, for example, you would be presented with an image in their ordinary life, like this one. And your brain has been very well trained to identify this object as a cat. Now, the reason uh, you are all so amazing at identifying cats is because since you are a small child, you've been collecting a large training set of cats. Right? And so this is what we want to do, except with our artificial neural networks. Right? We want to build a very complex, interconnected system where it learns through some input, and we can teach it knowing what the output is. But instead of uh, cats uh, in our training, we would use uh, observations or uh, simulation data to train the network. So in our first task, uh, we're going to train our network to find stellar feedback like the bubbles that you saw. So our goals are to identify bubbles uh, made by stellar winds, to identify features made by protostellar outflows, 
and to identify all pixels belonging to the feedback. So not just is there a bubble or an outflow in the image, but where is it and how big is it? The last thing we want is harder, and it's even hard for people, which is to identify feedback features in three-dimensional images. So in astronomy, that means spectral cubes. So this is a spectral cube of carbon monoxide emission. And what you're seeing is x, y, so projected position on the sky. And then along the line of sight is wavelength, which we can then convert into velocity using the Doppler effect. So this gives us a three-dimensional picture of what one of these structures looks like. As it's going around, you can see things sticking out are higher velocity, and those are outflows. And as we go around again, you'll see that there are some holes in it, which represent um, these stellar bubbles. All right, so to do this, we developed the Convolutional Approach to Structure Identification, or CASI 3D. So we trained CASI 3D with simulations uh, made uh, from these simulations of star-forming clouds. And in order to be able to apply it to observational data, we take the simulations and process them to create mock observations to make it as similar to the data as possible. So here is some example of our uh, validation set where, as you can see, the feedback features are actually not so easy to pick out. Uh, but our algorithm is able to do it. It finds the appropriate holes and correctly predicts uh, the locations and distribution of feedback really accurately. So now we can take this trained algorithm and apply it to actual observational data. So this is a data cube of CO emission in blue. And then the stellar bubble identified by CASI 3D in red. And you see it's kind of purple. Because CASI is able to pick out the bubble, pick out the shell, and it gives it some depth, and is able to trace out and separate this feature uh, from the rest of the cloud gas. And so this is a very hard problem. It would be very hard for a professional astronomer to do it. But as long as our algorithm is learning from synthetic data that represents this, it does a pretty amazing job. So now we can go ahead and apply this to the entire molecular cloud region, in this case to find protostellar outflows. So this is a very messy plot because it turns out there are a lot of them. These yellow here, this Y and, and O, those are young and older protostars, which we expect to be launching feedback. And a cloud like this one, Taurus, has hundreds of them. And so likewise, there are hundreds of signatures from this uh, protostellar outflows. The red is outflows and gas moving away, and the blue is gas moving towards. And it looks particularly messy in this vision because you're not seeing the 3D data, you're seeing the integrated projected distribution. So the takeaway from this is that CASI is fast, runs in seconds, and is reliable and gives us the same result every time and an efficiency which is better than expert astronomers. So next, I want to move on to predicting hidden relationships. The fundamental problem in astronomy is that we observe photons. Basic quantities that we would like to know, the density, the temperature, the magnetic field, these we cannot directly measure, and instead we have to infer them from the light that we detect. So we need to infer these from the light and the second problem is that we only often have a subset of that light, a narrow band of wavelengths. We don't have the whole spectrum. In addition, there's other complications with the light because the light changes as it interacts and passes through gas. Um, sometimes it's blocked and you don't see any light at all. And this creates a very complex observational problem. So the goals for our network is to use the infrared portion of the light spectrum to predict the total amount of heating from stars in the region. So we want to be able to predict this information without knowing the star locations. And this is because some of those stars are behind the cloud, some of them are in front of the cloud, and these are not impacting the cloud. So we wanted to be able to distinguish between things that are in the cloud and heating it and things that are outside. We want to put this together and predict the total radiation energy, the total energy from the stars in every pixel in our observation. To do this, we're going to use so-called diffusion models. This is a form of generative AI, which had been used for image generation. So this is from a research paper in 2020, where they show how you can start with one image of a person and diffuse it into another, and along the way, create a broad range of different images. Another example in the public domain is DALI2, uh, which they use the diffusion model as part of the algorithm for image generation. And so one could, using DALI, or the most recent version, 
create things that it didn't exist, such as two cats playing chess. Neither of these cats exist. The chessboard doesn't exist. But Dolly has dreamed up this result from its training using diffusion. Now, diffusion models in particular are quite cool because they are based and inspired by a physical principle of thermodynamics. They're inspired by the random motion of atoms. So the way it works is you feed forward your images and noise is being added. And as the noise is added and subtracted, the network learns how to diffuse the image into a part of the parameter space between what is real and what is not real. So we can use these uh, type of approaches, a diffusion model, to predict the stellar heating of the star forming region, MONAR2. So this is the infrared data. You can see where the young clusters are in green and blue here. This is what our model predicts. And indeed, this is the warmest parts of the gas here. And it's really centered on known existing clusters. And then we can go ahead and predict what that radiation field is for every pixel in this image. And if you flash between, uh, between these two ones, you can see there's a lot of additional things, these little dots. These are foreground or background stars. We do not want these in the data um, and in our prediction. And indeed, our algorithm has learned that those are not important and it ignores them. So in this way, we can now predict something that cannot be directly measured and we can calculate it more accurately than we could otherwise do directly from the data. So third, speeding up models. So the problem here is that astronomical timescales are astronomical. <laughs> right, so the timescales of star formation and galaxy evolution are much, much longer than human timescales, much, much longer than our lifetimes. And so we can't see the evolution uh, just by waiting around. And uh, if you try and tell a PhD student uh, that they should take on this problem, they are not going to like it very much. So for example, one of these molecular clouds has a lifetime of about 10 million years. A dense core is maybe a million years. And one of these accretion disks is about 2 million years. So these are extremely long time scales. So what we observe when we look through the telescopes is a snapshot of the way things are now. We don't get to see the real time evolution like we would in a simulation. But what if, what if we could take one observation, one snapshot, and predict the future from that snapshot? What if we could take one observation, a snapshot, and predict the past? Instead of having to wait around, what if we could use these neural networks to predict the future and the past from our one image? So this is the goal for our network. We want to predict how star-forming regions evolve over time. And remember, these are very long-lived. So we want, ideally, to be able to predict millions of years into the future or into the past. We also want to open new possibilities. If we can do this accurately, then potentially we can replace classic approaches of directly solving the equations and instead to go right to the predicted solution. So to do this um, approach, we adopted neural operators. Neural operators are still a neural network-based approach, but you're learning functions. You're learning underlying functions and using those for the prediction. So in our training, we have something like 12,000 simulation images and a time step of 8,000 years into the future. So here's what we get. Uh, on the left is the true gas density from the simulation. On the right is the predicted gas density. So our method does better than 99% accuracy uh, for five time steps. But even that is still not enough, because our classical approaches can do much, much better than 99%. So this is an area that's very much uh, being uh, researched and developed now. And there is a huge promise here for this to supplement or even replace our classical methods of equation solving. Now I want to switch gears to why does AI need astronomy? So to illustrate this, we can actually turn back to the HeadDex project. You can go online and visit the HeadDex website. And if you do, you'll see this very nice, friendly data access page. So the first reason why AI needs astronomy is that data from astronomy are public, plentiful, and non-proprietary. Right? So this data is freely shared. Um, and there's a lot of it, a million Lyman alpha emitters. And this is not like medical data where it's, uh, you know, there, there's some incentive financially for keeping it to ourselves. We want to share it 
Um, the public has paid for this data. We want to have an open uh, and collaborative environment. The second is because in addition to sharing the data, we also share our codes online. So you can go uh, to the HeadDex website and it has a link to Jupyter Notebooks. So these are Python notebooks that you can download yourself and use to manipulate the data. In addition, it has this very nice, friendly join the search, right? So astronomy is very open and collaborative, which is really great for AI development. Third, as you heard from Mahan, our data is fantastic. It is complex, it is noisy, it is high dimensional. So it circumscribes a really hard and challenging problem for AI methods. And so using this data, we can push the AI field more by challenging it with this type of very amazing data. Last but not least, um, astronomy presents a safe test bed for AI experimentation. So this is a news report uh, from last year um, from West Campus here in Austin. Spotted in West Campus early Sunday morning, one driverless car, then another, then another. It was just insane. Like I. They, they need to get better at uh, seeing where, where each other are positionally yeah. and uh, lining up. I mean, all of them are like facing sideways in the street, trying to navigate around each other, even though they're all part of the same network. Yeah, so uh, that's pretty embarrassing. Um, so we can obviously have uh, data embarrassments and AI embarrassments in astronomy, but it's not going to be quite at that level, right? So. Astronomy as a field, with its data, with its openness, provides a really great test bed for exploring these AI methods in a very safe environment. So I want to end with some future directions for AI and astronomy. So right now, um, there's been a revolution in generative AI methods. In particular, uh, ChatGPT has been in the news. So how many of you have heard of ChatGPT? Probably like all of you. How many of you have actually gone on and interacted with ChatGPT? That's a good fraction of you, right? All right, so we can do that here. So if you haven't done this, it's pretty easy. You can go to ChatGPT and you ask uh, it whatever question you like. For example, let's suppose uh, you wanted to know what is the definition of artificial intelligence? And faster than I can read, it will give you a response. We'll say AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence uh, processed by machines, especially computer systems. It includes learning, reasoning, self-correction. It's aimed at creating systems that can perform tasks that would typically require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and language translation. So this is a really excellent definition of AI. But some of you might be thinking, well, this was not so special. I could just go to Google, and I could Google it, and it would scrape the internet and come up with something very similar. But the benefit of ChatGPT is that it is, in fact, a very complex, large language model. So basically, it is not just the internet, but it's trained on the relationships of the internet, um, a very large fraction of it. And it's trained, given these input language words, to predict the next most likely output word. So this means that you can have conversations, you can have a dialogue with ChatGPT, which you can't have with Google. So for example, you could go here and say, um, I want uh, to give a talk about astronomy and AI. What should I talk about? And it will tell you, um, you could talk about data analysis and processing, image recognition, astroinformatics, automated discovery, data-driven astronomy, astrobiology, challenges and ethics, and future directions. <clears throat> By providing, by covering all of these topics, you can provide your audience with a comprehensive overview of exciting ways in which AI is shaping the field of astronomy and driving new discoveries about the universe. So this is also pretty good. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, ChatGPT can't give the talk for you yet. So it is very good at synthesizing and summarizing information, but is not so great on details. So it can tell you what you should talk about it, but it can't point to specific links or papers at the level that we would need to synthesize for this type of audience and presentation. Now, even though it can't do that, that is on the horizon. 
So I've been working uh, on a proposal for the past couple of months to propose an AI astronomy uh, institute. And this institute would tackle some of these issues. One thing we propose to develop is an AI co-pilot that is a large language model like ChatGPT, but trained on astronomy data, trained on astronomy publications and articles, one which you could interact and have dialogue with about your research. So for example, you could say, what wavelengths of light probe the structure and physics of quasar accretion disks? They would say optical, ultraviolet, x-ray can probe the structure. So it understands some, something about astronomy relationships between the item and the light in which you would use to observe it. You would then say, well, what wide field surveys cover these wavelengths and to what depths? And then it would say, well, there are several, and then give you examples of these and point to where they were. So it would know about existing data. You could then say, but do those surveys have published object catalogs in the optical? And then it would say, yes, this particular one, the legacy surveys have published optical photometric catalogs, including 2.4 billion objects, as described here. So it knows also what is in the catalogs and where to find it. What other types of data would be useful to supplement this? Um, it might say Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the DESI surveys provide additional information about redshifts and further distance to the quasars and the luminosity of their accretion disks. So it can, given what it knows about the data, do some reasoning to tell you how that data might connect to real physical relationships. You would go still further and say, how could I construct a query to cross match the catalogs for these two different surveys? and obtain the optical magnitude and redshift value. So basically, how can I find the objects that are in both the catalogs and get this data downloaded to my computer? And it would then suggest an SQL query, so a type of uh, coding that would access this database um, and then give you a suggested uh, piece of code. You could then either run it or not, or you'd copy it and run it yourself. So it can write code, and I should note that uh, many of these large language models are now doing this better and better. They are now able to write code. Uh, so this is very much within our vision of what is possible. Then you could say, okay, well, I'm still feeling lazy, so maybe I don't want to actually do this myself. Once it's retrieved, um, can you uh, determine typical quasar colors and then retrieve them for five typical quasars and then make an image where each of them is 10 arc seconds on the side? Also include the correct journal reference. And then it would go ahead and do this and say, using the median, here are our typical quasar colors, here are our uh, five images, and this is the actual publication where you can find this information. So it can find and calculate and synthesize. So this sounds very much like sci-fi, but many of these things are well within reach. Uh, there's been a very uh, strong growth of connecting these large language models into other domains. For example, connecting them with actual data uh, connecting images and text together, which allows you to type in, I would like uh, two cats playing chess. Um, they've been starting to connect these with videos. So you could describe a video that you would like it to develop. Um, but from the science pers perspective, it's also started to connect these with tools like calculators, right? So turns out large language models are pretty terrible at calculating and adding large numbers. But calculators, classical calculators are not. And so there's been this increasing push of integration between these language models and a large variety of tools that are useful. You can then enhance both what it can do and the accuracy. So note that I call this an Astro Copilot. So why Astro Copilot? And this is a very important reason, right, is that the Copilot never flies the plane alone, right? So this is not intended to do your research for you. You still need that dialogue. You still need that expertise to check what it is telling you. And it's more of a collaboration than using it as a robot to actually do your work. And this is a particularly important uh, distinction, uh, particularly as uh, people take responses from ChatGPT at face value. Um, and if you go to ChatGPT site, you will say, you know, ChatGPT can make mistakes. Consider checking important information. Very small print at the bottom, super, super important. It should be probably in large red letters at the top, uh, but it is not. So this is where astronomy and AI are going. Um, as the field of AI has exploded, we can harness many of those progress, uh, many of that progress for our own uh, research, 
and in turn use that to push forward astronomy discoveries. So that brings me to my conclusions. So AI is critical for solving open problems. I hope I convinced you of this. Um, astronomy needs AI, and I mentioned three specific things that it can do, right? You can use AI to search for features. People are great at this, but there's many benefits to training an AI model to do it for you. AI can predict hidden information. Yes, we can still calculate that information, uh, but sometimes it is actually easier and faster and better to do it by training on a very complex simulation. We can predict the future. So as we're making progress in, an, in AI, we're moving forward with being able to potentially replace existing approaches to modeling equations. And in turn, AI needs astronomy. Um, we heard this uh, this morning uh, in all these areas where AI and astronomy data, data is public, it is complex, it is safe. And so we have a lot to offer in astronomy to AI as a community. And last but not least, uh, the AI revolution is happening now, and you're going to see more and more domain-specific things, like this Astro Copilot, which are being used to make new discoveries and which are integrating AI and science to transform how we actually discover and do research. Thank you. That was great. I love the uh, I love that video. That was awesome. Okay, let's take some uh, some uh, questions. We have some time. Yep. So Stella, you showed the you showed the partial differential equation model before the simulation. So, what are are those equations deficient in some way at predicting what's observable? Um, I mean, I get the order reduction, the trying to speed up the simulations, but what's wrong with the the model? The, you know, the mathematical models that we currently have in your field. Yeah, so what is wrong with this is what you're saying. Yes. Like what, why? Okay. That's a great question. So the answer is there's nothing wrong with the models. Um, what is wrong is that our computers are too slow. The models are very complex. This is one equation out of, I don't know how many equations we're solving because we have to solve for the radiation and the gravity and the gas motions and the magnetic field. You have all these variables. They're coupled across this very large dynamic range. A simulation like this one spans seven orders of magnitude um, in spatial scale. And so this is an incredibly hard problem that is very slow. So the idea is that once you train a neural network, it is extremely fast, right? So if you can train it to learn the underlying relationships, it can be used as a kind of dimensionality reduction of the parameter space. So by doing that, we could hope to speed up maybe the slowest parts of these kind of classical uh, approaches. Yes. I, I have a question. Um, along with ChatGPT, there's Solar that's come out. Are you going to be using that, or can you get it? That's a good question. What is Solar? Oh, there you are. Solar is where you put in a word and it creates a video. Oh, uh, yes, so that one. So you could possibly, I mean, it's not available to the general public, unfortunately. but. Um, you could possibly use that. I'm just wondering if, if that's something you could use. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that would be amazing for, for example, designing video games or movies. Maybe in the far future it would be useful for us. Uh, I think the, the problem is that in making these images, we need to preserve the underlying physical relationships. And that is a challenge. So AI can um, make images, they can make videos now, but preserving that, that correctness of the physical world is hard. Um, and I think in seeing articles about what this capability can do, sometimes it does very funny things um, in terms of making its predictions, which you would not do if you were a human trying to design such a video. But yes, in the future, I think maybe we will. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as far as uh, coding and operation, what's the difference between an algorithm and an intelligent algorithm? Um, difference between an algorithm and an intentional, uh, intelligent algorithm. So I think the, the machine learning is a good example of this. The, these artificial neural networks work because they have a large number of parameters. And so by funneling data through these algorithms, you are 
identifying and tuning the parameters for a certain situation. And so it is still an algorithm, but we say it's intelligent because I, as a person, could not have said, set that parameter to this value, right? It is a process of looking through the data and iteratively tuning those parameters to it, for it to match the input data. OK, back. Oh, so go ahead. Oh, OK. Oh, oh is it my turn? Yep. OK, hey, hi. Uh, first of all, I, I love the fact, I'm Rabbi Rabbi, and so Shabbat Shalom, I'm, I love the fact your name means star. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, so somebody knew that you were going to do this. Mm -hmm. did, did that direct you towards this by any chance? No, it's my great grandmother's name. Cool. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's predicting the past uh, to, to, to predict the future. Um, so I, I've always been hyper visual. And so my first question that I shouted out loud, I'm, I'm, a, I'm still a little bit ADDDDD. And um, the. Uh, the largest neighborhood that you showed us with the clusters and, and formations. How recent was that image, give or take? Um, you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so there's this time effect because uh, the speed of light isn't infinite, right? Whenever we uh, detect a photon, we're looking at that photon as it was emitted in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so it depends on the distances. Uh, to these different regions. Well, no, I just mean right. I, I, the, the, the image itself that you showed with, uh, with the circles and yeah, neighborhoods. You're, you're not asking me a physics question. No, you're asking no, where I'm, did this I'm come asking from? you. I'm asking you that a, is great. a, a okay. human time scale question, so yeah. Yeah, so this is a new JWST image. Um, it's really beautiful. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image. So this is, you know, taken in the last couple of years, year or two. Um, this is image could be from sometime in the last 10 years. Um, this is Herschel Space Telescope. Uh, this is yeah, Herschel and Herschel. Um, this, I'm trying to remember, I think might be Alma. Yeah, so, so they're all pretty recent observational images using this kind of state is, of the is art. Is James facilities. Webb helping? Oh, yeah. Yeah, James Webb is helping. Um, I have to admit that my science and star formation is a very cold process by and large, and so we can't use JWST to look at the clouds or study the clouds themselves are too cold. But the protostars, these young stars, and certainly the jets, uh, which are quite warm, those JWST can do a pretty amazing job of um, observing. And, and I'm a word freak and a poet. Uh, and I just want to comment on the fact that it was not evolutionary. Uh, it, was, it was a convulsory uh, study. Didn't, wasn't that the word that was used? Um, compulsory for? Con convulsory, convulse. Ah. Convulse, conv convulse, you know, it was like maybe, you know, four, five minutes or so in the lecture after this. The, the, that, was, that was the word. Okay, here. Here. Question over here. So, so as a uh, lay person, lay as in like prostrate here, um, I'm wondering what we lose when an AI makes choices. If you asked me to draw cats playing chess, I would come up with a specific image and you could ask me why is, why do you have a tuxedo cat and a gray tabby as compared to a ginger? And I could tell you, but you might not even know with uh, the black box of an AI system, why it shows the particular configuration of the chessboard. Uh, so what happens to all the information that gets eaten in that process that we never even see? Yeah, that is a really great question. And I think there's a whole area of, of let's say, ethics considerations. Um, for your specific question, there is a developing field of uh, explainability uh, in which we try to interrogate the black boxes. And we not only make them predict something or draw something, but explain why they did it. And this is fundamental to being trustworthy. Because if you don't understand why this answer was returned or why this image was returned, it's very hard to trust that is doing something right. And so this is a field where everyone is certainly thinking about and concerned about this. 
Uh, but it's, it's a slow process. We're still developing what is the best way to interrogate these AI networks uh, and get an explainable reason for what they're doing. You had a second part of the question, which is what are we losing? Um, and so chat GBT is trained on the internet, right? So it's trained on a lot of the internet. And we, we created the internet. But the internet by and of itself is not creative, right? And so right now, these AI systems seem like they're being creative and generating new things. But they are, in some sense, a mirror or reflection back at us for what we give it. And so I think it is something that we need to think about and proceed carefully with, because we don't want to ever shut down human innovation uh, just by turning too much to AI and relying upon it to tell us things and, and predict things. So we have an online question that Anna will read. Yeah. So we got a question from our live stream from Josh Friedman. Specific to your astronomy research, are there any blind spots you try to be mindful of when making use of the reasoning and information synthesis offered by AI? So blind spots. Yeah, so we can tie that into the previous question. I think about explainability um, a lot um, and why uh, the algorithm is making the prediction that it does. Right now, everything I do in the analysis has guardrails where I we spend most of our time building the training set and checking the results. We spend relatively little time running the algorithm. Almost all of it involves checking on cases where we are very confident of the answer and making sure that it's recovering that answer and doing what we think it's going to do. So yeah, I, I think maybe the most dangerous blind spots are the ones that we don't know about. Um, but for now, we are really very careful about the guardrails and making sure before we put anything out there, before we publish any code, before we write any papers, we spend so much time just checking and saying, OK, now we have this independent set. These are visual identifications that people have done. How, can we recover them? And so there, a lot of the time is just spent doing those kind of checks to make sure that we don't have blind spots uh, on the results that we're getting. OK, any additional questions? Yes. Do you always, if you ask the question several times, do you always get the same answer? Um, it depends which, which algorithm are you talking about. Uh, so ChatGPT, no. Um, these, um, this convolutional neural network, this CASI 3D, yes. Um, diffusion models, in large, yes. Uh, but there is a kind of stochastic component of it. Um, some of these algorithms are built on some random seeds. And so if you change something, like this unsupervised machine learning we heard about this morning, then that would create a difference. So in using these techniques, that answering that question is important to know um, as you're doing your research, uh, because you do want these repeatable answers. If you need your answer to be absolutely the same every time, then that might direct you to one algorithm over another um, for your work. OK, great. That was excellent, Stella. Thank you. <laughs> so excellent. Uh, I just want to announce on March 7th, I have the day, there's going to be a live deep sky tour uh, at, McDonald Observer, at the McDonald Observatory Visitor Center. Uh, and I've, it's going to be online. Uh, and Stella's going to make herself available. So I assume you'll have. Additional questions, you can go uh, a catcher on March 7th. Um, it's about eight hours. Yes, you can more than welcome to drive out there. I love driving out there. Yes. Um, so this, this concludes the BOV meeting. Uh, I, I, I had a wonderful time. I hope you had a wonderful time. Uh, I learned a lot. I enjoyed talking with you all. Uh, I want to so just say a big thanks to you all. That's fantastic. Let's uh, thank all the speakers who are still here there now. <laughs> and the summer BOV meeting is July 26th and 27th. And please, when you leave, 